three, two, one, and liftoff. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger B. Chafee are remembered as a seasoned test pilot, the first American to walk in space, and a promising rookie. The term Apollo 1 evokes the tragic cabin fire on January 27, 1967, during a launch rehearsal at Cape Kennedy that claimed all three lives before the spacecraft ever launched. While the disaster highlights lessons in engineering and safety, there's a more human story of recovery, investigation, and the solemn journeys that return them to their families. Today, we ask what happened to the bodies of the Apollo 1 disaster crew. Inside the capsule and recovering the crew. When the tragedy struck, one of the astronauts shouted, fire in the spacecraft. In a few seconds, all three were victims of the swift inferno which left the capsule a blackened shell. One reporter said it looked like the inside of a furnace. On January 27, 1967, a plugs-out test of the Apollo Command module aimed to verify its ability to run on internal power. The spacecraft was on its Saturn IB at Launch Complex 34, unfueled and safe from hazard. During the test, a spark from vulnerable wiring ignited material in the cabin, which was pressurized with pure oxygen. Flames quickly engulfed the interior, increasing pressure to about 29 psi and causing significant damage as smoke filled the cabin. Ground crews faced challenges accessing the hatch, which took about five minutes to open due to high internal pressure. The crew's bodies were found in critical positions. Roger Chafee was strapped in and communicating Ed White was attempting to open the hatch but was overcome, and Gus Grissom lay unstrapped on the cabin floor. Their suits had melted, complicating extraction efforts. Recovery of the astronauts took hours, requiring a methodical approach to safely detach each individual from the cabin's interior while managing toxic gases and intense heat. This tragic incident highlighted the risks and complexities of space exploration, particularly in emergency situations. Cause of Death and Injuries Investigation Astronauts had worked in pure oxygen atmospheres before, hundreds of thousands of times without incident. The probability of accident was small. Apollo engineers were willing to take the gamble. But in manned spaceflight, errors are unforgivable. The Apollo 204 Review Board quickly impounded all Apollo 1 hardware and records, conducting a thorough disassembly and documenting it with detailed photography. Autopsies revealed that the primary cause of death for the three astronauts was cardiac arrest due to high levels of carbon monoxide and other toxic gases, indicating that asphyxiation, not thermal injuries, was the critical factor, with most burns occurring post-mortem. The cabin's pure oxygen environment made normally safe materials flammable, and the hatch design and emergency procedures severely limited survival chances once a fire ignited. The board couldn't pinpoint a single ignition source, but noted arcing in several areas, particularly near abraded wiring. Experiments later revealed that silver-plated copper in contact with ethylene glycol could react violently in pure oxygen, a significant oversight. Witness accounts from the launch pad added emotional context, with observers noting White reaching for the hatch handle as flames spread. These details highlighted the tragic reality of the event, where training and courage fell short amidst chaos. Afterwards, considerations shifted to how to honor these three men who symbolized both risk and resolve, with care of their remnants transitioning to military and family protocols, acknowledging their service and the significance of their loss. Family Notifications and Funeral Plans The notification process on January 27th and the days that followed 
unfolded along familiar military lines, but with extraordinary public attention. NASA leaders and flight crew office representatives coordinated with the families of Grissom, White, and Chafee, each of whom lived in the tight-knit astronaut community around Houston. The men were not anonymous test subjects, but national figures whose faces had been on television and magazine covers, which complicated privacy. Yet the families were given space to determine funeral preferences within the framework of honors accorded to those who die in service. Ed White, a West Point graduate who had carried the American flag on his historic Gemini 4 spacewalk, had made his wishes clear about where he wanted to be laid to rest, despite NASA officials pressing for burial at Arlington National Cemetery to keep the crew together in public memory, his widow Pat insisted on West Point Cemetery. Astronaut Frank Borman helped ensure those wishes were respected. That decision emphasized that even in the shadow of national mourning, the primary stewardship of a body and memory rests with the family. Gus Grissom and Roger Chafee, both with deep Midwestern roots and strong ties to the services, were interred at Arlington. The care of their remnants included all the ceremonial elements one would expect for those who died in duty. The professional dignity, the folded flags, the presence of comrades and officials spoke to the immediate resolve that the men's sacrifice be given a permanent, hallowed address. At the same time, the ceremonies had a practical effect. They created a focal point for future observances, the place where NASA, classmates, and the public could return as anniversaries came around and as the Apollo program moved from grief back into flight. For the families, those days were a blur of arrangements, quiet meetings, and the sudden task of balancing private grief with a public that wanted to pay respects. The question, what happened to the bodies, is necessarily clinical, but the answer passes through living rooms and chapels, through the calm council of chaplains and commanders, and through choices that reflect identity, tradition, and promises made at kitchen tables long before the first mission patch was sewn. The coffins, carried with care, represented not only the men, but also the unfinished chapter of a program that eventually carried their patch to the surface of the moon. In the wake of the funerals came another kind of body handling, one belonging to history. The Apollo 1 crew's names would be etched into plaques, spoken at memorials, and embedded in rituals at launch sites and mission control. Those symbolic acts are part of how a culture manages the loss of its explorers. Final Resting Places And one of the things that deeply worries the astronauts, themselves test pilots by training, is that not too much be made of their dying when it happens. That accidents in spaceflight, exposed as it is to the glare of publicity, not be overemphasized. Gus Grissom and Roger B. Chafee were buried at Arlington National Cemetery, where their graves sit among those of soldiers from earlier wars and later missions. The location communicates continuity. Test pilots and astronauts belong to a lineage that accepts hard duty and its consequences. Ed White's grave at West Point places him among the long gray line aligning his legacy with the institution that shaped his career and character. The placement of bodies says something about values and affiliations. It also defines where ceremonies recur and where the public goes to remember. Over time, the nation marked their names with distinctions that tether the immediate loss to enduring recognition. President Jimmy Carter awarded the Congressional Space Medal of Honor posthumously to Grissom in 1978. Nineteen years later, President Bill Clinton presented the same honor to White and Chafee. These awards did not move bodies or alter headstones, but they added layers to the official biography that accompanies any visit to Arlington or West Point. They ensured that the men's final, incomplete mission would be framed by language that honors their service and loss in the canon of American exploration. Within NASA's own culture, the handling of memory became ritualized in ways both solemn and practical. The Space Mirror Memorial at Kennedy Space Center lists their names among others lost in the pursuit of flight. At Launch Complex 34, a pair of plaques on the remaining concrete pedestal greet visitors with Latin words that astronauts have long embraced, ad astra per aspera. Each year, families and space workers gather there, reading names aloud where the pad once stood and where the smoke once roiled. These rites are not abstract. They're designed spaces and repeated acts that surround where bodies once were and where now memory is kept. Gone but never forgotten. And all of this has been been built on the shoulders of the people who have sacrificed. Cities and institutions across the U.S. have created memorials to honor the Apollo 1 crew, linking their legacy to education and the space program. Schools in Alabama are named for Grissom, White, and Chafee, fostering awareness about their contributions among students, while Purdue University connects their names to the training of future engineers. 
The NASA Astronaut Memorial Grove features trees as organic memorials that invite reflection and remembrance alongside cultural representations in film and television that keep their stories alive. Now it's time to hear from you. How can we best honor these intrepid explorers? Let us know in the comments section below.